Okay, so I'm just going to get started first just with a little bit, just a, a moment of review from last time. Um, I talked last time about uh, looking at the past and why we look at the past, right? And I just want to review that for one moment because we are going to be going pretty far into the past, uh, back to, to 1651 when, uh, when Hobbes published his Leviathan. Uh, and I want to remind us what, what's, what's the point of this? You know, this, is, this seems like old news, right? Um, maybe uh, outdated news, but, but I don't actually think it's really outdated. And, 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 and for a basic reason about looking at the past, um, which is to say that every time we have a present, I mean, a lot of people think, well, we, we must include the past in the present. But no, in fact, you know, every present includes a certain selection of, of sort of knowledge, insights, methodologies from the past. Uh, it's just a certain selection. Uh, and when you move from the present into the future, it's, it's inevitably going to be through an engagement with the past, with, with looking at um, something that we've kind of lost track of in the past, in, in, in the recent present, um, or, uh, or reinterpreting something from the past that we, we thought was familiar to us, but in fact we, we realized we, we actually under, didn't understand in, in the way we could be understanding it, right? And so, so that engagement of the past really is at the basis of creating anything new for the future. Um, and so I think that's, that's one of the, the key reasons for looking in the past. And so it's, it's, it's really um, in going back to Hobbes right now um, that we're going to be able to gain some insights into looking at the question of the origin of language as it's discussed uh, by researchers today. And so that's, that's the premise here that, that we're working with in, in looking at these older texts. Right? And I think Hobbes is actually a very good place to start um, uh, because he has actually uh, uh, a very sophisticated notion of the origin of language, but it's also embedded in a particular interpretation that he has um, that's kind of wedded to his past. Right? So let's take a look. Uh, first, just briefly about Hobbes. Right? Um, he was born uh, 1588, uh, the year of the Spanish Armada. Uh, if you know anything about Spanish Armada, they, they built this huge armada of ships to go attack England. Um, and uh, apparently, the story goes that um, he was a premature baby because when his mother heard about the Spanish Armada, she was so scared that she gave birth then and there. Right? So anyway, that's, that's the story about how um, Hobbes was born. He died in uh, 1679. He studied at Magdalen College, which uh, was part of what is today Oxford University. And in Paris, he worked as a tutor um, to various families. So back then, you know, there, was, there was no sort of um, mass public education, so what, what, what happened was rich families would hire tutors to, uh, to, to, to educate their children. And, and, and in fact, lots of, of writers, uh, philosophers, that's how they gained their living. And that's, that's, what, uh, that's what Hobbes did uh, for a good part of his life. Um, he was involved, I mean, he started out um, studying law, but then he, he, he continued then as a tutor. He, he wrote the Leviathan in Paris during the time of the, Spanish, of the English Civil War. He was very much involved in politics. Um, and um, though it was a primarily a tr political treatise, he starts out um, his, his, his treatise on, um, on sort of, the, the, sort of the, the stepping stones toward what he thinks is, is, a, is an adequate politics. And so part of that is sort of investigating the nature of humanity, um, and, he begins and he begins that discussion with the nature of language. Right? Um, so that's, that's where we are, we, basically in the second chapter of, of Leviathan, where he talks about language. Okay? So um, what does he say? Um, he starts out with a very basic notion about the definition and function of speech. Right? Um, so this is a quote um, from his text, and, he, and, and what's key here, you know, he starts out with sort of the, the big picture, which says the most noble and profitable venture of all, was, uh, of all of it was speech, consisting of names or appellations and their connection. And that's the key. I mean, that's his sort of key definition. Um, you know, we've got um, speech, human speech, consists of two things. It seems of, of names, which is, are words, and then their connection, a kind of con the, the connections between the words, the grammar, right? Uh, and so that's for him the most basic definition. Right? If we see both of those things, um, then we know we have human language. Right? If we don't have both of the things, then there's something missing. And so if you, if you think back on our video uh, of, of Kanzi, we'd have to think, well, does he have a grammar? I mean, is he working with a grammar? And we're going we're to come back to that question later. Um, but you know, that's the key one, at least for Hobbes, for determining if, um, 
uh, if we have, we're working with human language, right? So I think it's pretty clear when we're, we're, when we're talking about like sort of dog signals, there's no real grammar, right? There's a, you know, the, a, a dog can recognize particular signs, uh, but there's no sense in which those signs stand in relationship to each other in a, in a, in a, in a kind of grammar, okay? So we'll have to go back and see if Kanzi can do that. Um, the next thing is that in the continuation of this paragraph, he goes and looks and, and, and catalogs uh, the different functions of speech, right? Uh, and he says, you know, one of them, th it's, it's, it's the means by which men register their thoughts, uh, recall them um, when they are past, right? So uh, they were able to take thoughts and somehow kind of take hold of them, register them, uh, kind of keep an index of our thoughts. So that's the first function. And he's, he's really saying that there's a, there's a key aspect of speech for, for thinking. Um, then he says we can we use speech to recall those thoughts when they're past. Um, and so if, they're, if, uh, if we didn't have speech, these thoughts would then kind of, kind of disappear into our, um, into our past without being capable of being recalled to us into the present, right, later on, right? And then finally, I mean, this is actually the third thing, and it's, it, seems, it seems almost backwards, but um, communication, all, <laughs> he does include communication, so declare um, them one to another. Um, but I think it's significant that he, this is his, his third function of speech, and it's not his first, right? And, and that he sort of understands human language as something in the first place useful for um, putting together our thoughts, and then really in the third instance as a means of communication, right? Um, and, then, and then when he talks about communication, and this is sort of an indication about the way in which he's seeing um, language as a part of his political treatise. He's, he's, then he talks about how speech is necessary for com commonwealth, um, society, contract, and peace, right? So, um, so he's talking then about the, the ways in which language are really essential for human kinds of society um, and for, for building the kind of cooperation um, that, that human society is capable of, right? Okay, so that's sort of his, his that, you know, it's kind of the, his opening uh, remarks about language and, and how it functions, and then what he does in the rest of this section is he really kind of tries to unpack this. And so that's what we're going to do as well. We're going to kind of uh, go along with him in unpacking this, right? So just one moment. We're going we're to pause for a moment just to, to see how we've, we've done with this part.